Hello friends, welcome to Shankar IAS Academy Daily Newspaper Analysis. Today's date is 10-6-2024. Behind me are the list of articles that we are about to discuss today. So without much delay, let's get started. Before we start our today's discussion, there is one important announcement about Shankar's Telegram live series which is going to be a key to conquer this year prelims 2024. So join us for a live session featuring Mr. Raja IAS who will speak about stress management as we are getting into the last week of this exam. So don't miss this opportunity to gain unparalleled insights and skyrocket your preparation. So tune into Shankar's Telegram live series and stay focused and positive. To join our Telegram channel, click on the link in the description or in the pinned comment. Look at this previous year prelim question. Consider the following statements. Capital adequacy ratio is the amount that bank have to maintain in the form of their own fund to offset any loss that the bank incur if any account holder fails to repay. Capital adequacy ratio is decided by each individual banks. Which of the statements given above is or correct? One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. See this question test your understanding of capital adequacy ratio. Let's revise the basics about this capital adequacy ratio and come back to this question. See, CAR or capital adequacy ratio is the measure that ensures banks have enough capital to absorb the potential losses. It is calculated by dividing the bank's capital by its risk weighted assets. Now let's see who regulates this ratio. See, CAR is regulated by central banking authorities or financial regulators. For instance, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision which provides international standards known as Basel 1, Basel 2 and Basel 3 sets guidelines on CAR. These guidelines are adopted and enforced by the national regulatory bodies like the Federal Reserve in the US or the Reserve Bank of India. Here the regulatory authorities ensure banks adhere to the minimum CAR which varies depending on the region and specific regulatory framework. For example, under Basel 3, banks are required to maintain a CAR of at least 8% with additional buffer for systemic risk and other factors. Now let us see why it is important. See, the primary purpose of CAR is to protect depositors and promote the stability of the financial system. By maintaining adequate capital, bank can handle losses while continuing to operate and providing services. This ratio also provides confidence among the depositors and investors, knowing that the bank has a cushion against potential financial issues. With this understanding about CAR, let's go back to the question. Look at this statement one. See, CAR is the amount that the bank have to maintain in the form of their own funds to offset any loss that the bank may occur if any account holder fails to repay the dues. Yes, this statement is correct. And now, with respect to the statement 2, see the CAR is decided by each individual bank. See this statement, incorrect. As we have discussed, CAR is not decided by the individual banks. Instead, it is regulated by the central banking authorities or financial regulators. So the correct answer for this question is option A, one only. With this, let's move to our next question. Look at this previous year prelim question. What is greenhouse gas protocol? Option A. It is an international accounting tool for the government and business leaders to understand, quantify and manage greenhouse gas emission. Option B. It is an initiative of United Nations to offer financial incentives to the developing countries to reduce greenhouse gas emission and to adopt eco-friendly technologies. Option C. It is an intergovernmental agreement ratified by all the members of United Nations to reduce greenhouse gas emission to the specified levels by the year 2022. Option D. It is one of the multilateral REDD plus initiative hosted by World Bank. Now let us solve the question. Here the correct answer is option 1. Let us discuss about greenhouse gas protocol in brief. C. It is actually a tool for the global accounting that helps leaders in the industry and government comprehend, measure and control greenhouse gas emission. This protocol is a result of a decade-long relationship between World Resources Institute that is WRI and the World Business Council for the Sustainable Development. It creates a comprehensive global standardized framework for measuring and managing emissions from operations, value chains, products, cities and policies in the public and private sector. Note that the protocol collaborates with the business, governments and the environmental organization from all over the world to create a new generation of credible and successful programs for combating climate change. In addition, Greenhouse Gas Protocol offers companies and organizations an opportunity to apply for our built-on Greenhouse Gas Protocol mark. 
that recognizes sector guidance, product rules or the tools that are in conformance with GHG protocol standards. That's all about this discussion. With this, let's move on to our daily newspaper analysis. Look at this article. This article speaks about the trend of NOTA votes in the left-wing extremism affected areas. So let us analyze this article and understand some important points. See in the year 2014 and 2019 elections, many voters in specific constituencies that are affected by LWE that is left-wing extremism chose NOTA. This trend continued in the 2024 elections also. Despite the overall decline, the NOTA still plays a significant role in this specific region. In the 2024 Lok Sabha election, the overall NOTA vote share across India dropped below 1% for the first time since the introduction in 2014. This year, 0.99% of Indian voters have chosen NOTA. Bastar in Chhattisgarh, Koraput and Nabarangpur in Odisha recorded high NOTA votes in the last three general elections. Araku in Andhra Pradesh showed a high NOTA vote share in 2019 and 2024. These seats are affected by the left-wing extremism. The high NOTA shares in the left-wing extremism affected districts have also been noted in various assembly elections also. This is all about the information from the news article. Moving further, we shall understand about left-wing extremism in detail. First, let us understand about its origin of the movement. The movement started in 1967 in Naxalbari, which is a small village in West Bengal. It was started under the leadership of Charu Majumdar and Kanu Sanyal. The movement was driven by issues like land reforms, exploitation and the socio-economic inequalities. The aim of this movement is to overthrow the Indian state through the armed rebellion and establish a communist government. Now we shall briefly look at the causes of the rise of this movement. See, the rise of left-wing extremism in India is primarily due to socio-economic disparities, landlessness and the exploitation of marginalized communities, particularly tribals and the lower caste. Poor governance, corruption and inadequate public service have further fueled the discontent. Additionally, the displacement from the land due to industrial and the mining projects without a proper rehabilitation has aggravated their grievance. These factors created a fertile ground for the rise of extremist ideologies which advocated for the redistribution of land and resources. Now moving on, we shall look at the affected areas. See, the movement actually spread to several states, primarily in central and the eastern India, including Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Odisha, Bihar, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra and West Bengal. The most affected regions are often referred to as Red Corridor. Look at this map to note the affected areas. Now let us see some important measures taken by government against the rise of left-wing extremism. Specialized anti naxal forces like Commando Battalion for Resolute Action, shortly called as COBRA, was formed. Greyhound are also a specialized force formed against Naxalites. Operation Green Hunt was launched in 2009. This large-scale operation involved coordinated efforts by states and central armed police forces to combat Naxalite insurgent. Nextly, the special central assistance is a financial support to the most affected districts for the critical infrastructure gaps and socio-economic development. And another important measure is Samadhan, that is S-A-M-A-D-H-A-N. Samadhan doctrine is the one-stop solution for the left-wing extremism problem. It encompasses the entire strategy of the government from a short-term policy to a long-term policy formulated at different levels. The national strategy to counter left-wing extremism was formed in 2015 as a multi-pronged approach to combat left-wing extremism. Its main aim was to ensure participatory governance and the protection of the rights of the local tribals and other marginalized communities. And also the intelligence sharing and the rising of a separate 66 Indian Reserved Battalion was done by government to curb the menace of left-wing extremism organization. These are some of the measures taken by the government to tackle the menace of LWE. Finally, we shall conclude our discussion by summarizing the views of left-wing extremism. See, LWE involves in violent insurgency, which leads to loss of life, destruction of property and destabilization of regions. It undermines the rule. It undermines the rule of the law and democratic processes. So it must be eradicated and neutralized. On the other hand, the rise of left-wing extremism in the backyard region, in the backward regions, highlights the socio-economic inequalities and injustice faced by the marginalized communities. 
these root causes must be addressed by the government in a just and inclusive manner that's all about this discussion with this let's move on to our next topic look at this news article india and us have successfully resolved seven long standing disputes on trade at wto including a decade old poultry dispute see this poultry dispute mainly deals with india's import restriction on us poultry products due to avian influenza concerns the wto has ruled against india but the prolonged negotiation or needed to settle the matter see this type of prolonged disputes will lead to wastage of money time in enforcing any contract therefore it necessitates a comprehensive development of alternative dispute resolution ecosystem for a speedy disposal of cases this is all about this article now in our discussion we are going to see about alternative dispute redressal mechanism in brief through our mains answer writing approach firstly let us look into the syllabus see this topic will come under gs paper 2 now look at this question why having an alternative dispute resolution mechanism is imperative for the indian legal scenario discuss can you identify the existing alternative institutional arrangements for dispute resolution in india and also discuss their merits and limit see this question is a well structured one it asks us to state the importance of having an alternate dispute resolution mechanism in indian legal scenario moreover it asks us to enlist about the existing ones their advantages and disadvantages let us start with an introduction alternative dispute resolution mechanism that is adr refers to the methods of resolving disputes outside the court the various methods include mediation arbitration conciliation etc see generally it uses a neutral third party who helps the parties to communicate discuss the differences and resolve the disputes the various laws which are governing the adr are section 89 of civil procedures code 1908 legal service authority act 1987 arbitration and conciliation act 1996 mediation act 2023 etc this can be your intro now in our main body of the answer see the first part of the body let us discuss about the importance of alternate dispute resolution in india firstly it addresses the overburden judiciary see the indian judicial system is notoriously overburden with a massive backlogs of cases as of recent study millions of cases are pending across various courts in india this leads to prolonged litigation and delayed justice undermining the public confidence in the judicial system secondly speedy resolution of cases the adr mechanism such as arbitration mediation and conciliation offer a faster resolution of disputes compared to traditional court proceedings this is crucial in a country like india where timely justice is essential for maintaining social and economic stability thirdly cost effectiveness see a litigation can be expensive due to legal fees court fees and other associated cost adr mechanism or generally less expensive making them accessible to a larger section of society fourthly the flexibility see the adr offers greater flexibility in terms of procedure and rules which can be tailored to suit the needs of disputing parties this is particularly beneficial in complex commercial disputes where the specialized knowledge and customized procedure are often required fifthly the confidentiality the adr process especially mediation and arbitration are conducted in private which ensures confidentiality this is particularly important in the commercial disputes where the parties may prefer to keep sensitive information out of public domain sixthly preservation of relationships adr particularly the mediation and conciliation focuses on mutually acceptable solution which can help to preserve the relationship between the parties which can help to preserve the relationship between the parties this is beneficial in family disputes business partnership and other scenarios where maintaining a relationship is very important for all these reasons adr can be an effective mechanism for india now let us see various existing arrangements in india with their merits and demerits firstly the mediation here the mediator plays a passive role as a communicator and helps the parties to reach a mutually acceptable solution to the dispute it is having various merits like the decisions are not binding promotes mutual agreement cost effective preserves relationship and being very flexible etc on the other hand the limitations like non bindingness can lead to non compliance depend on willingness of the parties to cooperate and no guaranteed resolution etc secondly conciliation in this arrangement an impartial third party called conciliator will play an active role and assist the party to reach mutually satisfactory agreed settlement an important point to be noted is such agreements are non binding to the parties the merits and demerits are similar to the mediation thirdly arbitration see the arbitration decides an award 
on the dispute that is mostly binding on the party so the benefit like binding decision faster resolution expertise of arbitrators confidentiality etc on the other hand the limitations include the awards or expensive limited scope for appeal risk of bias if arbitrators are not neutral fourthly with lok adalat that is people's court the merit or free of cost quick resolution binding decision informal setting accessible to the poor but the limitations are limited to specific types of cases that is family disputes motor accidents claim etc the decisions are binding but not appealable the quality of justice can vary finally with the ombudsman scheme the merits like specialized for addressing public grievances independent authority cost effective and being very accessible but the limitations are like limited scope that is specific to the sectors like banking insurance etc and also the decisions are recommendatory and not binding depend on the institutional cooperation is there so this can be your body part of the answer now moving on to the conclusion see the adr mechanism or imperative for the indian legal scenario due to their potential to reduce the burden on judiciary provide faster and cost effective resolution maintaining confidentiality and preserve relationship however each adr mechanism has their own merits and limitation the effectiveness of adr in india depends on various factors including the willingness of the parties to participate expertise of the facilitators and the tenure and the nature of disputes etc moreover increasing the awareness and encouraging the use of adr can significantly contribute to the efficiency and the efficacy of the indian legal system that's all for this question with this let's move on to our next topic look at this hindu article a small grocery shop near munar in kerala has been repeatedly raided by wild elephants according to the shop owner the shop has faced over 20 elephant attacks since 2008 most recently a herd of six elephants raided the shop on saturday night with one tusker breaking a window to steal some commodities at the shop see this is a typical example of man animal conflict and we are able to see them increasing day by day since we have discussed in detail about the man animal conflict in our previous videos now let's explore other dimension firstly what are the general characteristics of an elephant see the elephants are the largest land animals on the earth they are known for their intelligence social behavior and impressive memory an elephant's tusk is a versatile tool used to breathing smelling touching grasping and producing sounds and also the elephants have a long curved tusk made of ivory used for digging lifting objects gathering foods and also for the defense purpose now let us talk about their gestation and the role of female elephants see the female elephants also known as cows have a long gestation period lasting about 22 months this is the longest pregnancy of any land animal after this period usually one calf is born though twins are rare when a calf is born it weighs around 100 kg and it is about 1 meter tall and also the calves rely on the mother's milk for the first 2 years but they start trying solid foods around the 6 months time the female elephants play a crucial role in the herd which is typically matriarchal meaning that it is led by the oldest and often the largest female the matriarch makes decision for the group like where to find the food and water the female elephants are highly social and protective raising calves together and teaching them essential survival skills note that there are two main types of elephant species they are asian elephant and african elephant now let us see the difference between the asian and the african varieties firstly the size the african elephants are generally larger than the asian counterparts secondly the ears the african elephants have much larger ears shaped like an african continent thirdly the tusk both male and female african elephants typically have tusk whereas in asian elephants only some male have tusk fourthly the head shape see the african elephants have more rounded head with a single dome while the asian elephants have a twin domed head fifthly african elephants are found in various environment including savannas forest and desert across 37 countries in africa whereas the asian elephants are found in the forest and grasslands in 13 countries across south and southeast asia finally the both species live in complex social groups but african elephants tend to form larger heads and also both species are herbivores but their diets differ slightly based on their habitat and one more important thing to note here is their iucn status see for the african elephant and more importantly the african forest elephant are critically endangered 
whereas african savanna elephant are endangered and the asian elephants are endangered that's all about the major differences between the asian and the african elephant with this let's move to our next article look at the science page article scientists have created a low cost portable mri machine that can help to improve medical diagnostics in india this new machine uses a weaker magnet and it is much cheaper than the traditional mri machines it can be plugged into a regular wall socket and does not need expensive infrastructure with the help of special software it produces clear images despite the low magnetic strength and also it is tested on 30 volunteers and it has successfully imaged various body parts this affordable mri machine can be used for quick test emergencies children's care and also it makes medical scans more accessible in india thus we can say mri is a potential prelims question so with this backdrop let us understand about mri in brief so firstly what is an mri see mri stands for magnetic resonance imaging it is a machine that helps doctors to see inside your body without a surgery but how it is possible see it uses a strong magnets and radio waves to create detailed picture of your organs tissues and bones the mri machine has powerful magnets that create a strong magnetic field around your body it then sends a radio waves through your body these waves bounce back and are picked up by the machine which turns them into pictures and also the doctor use these mri machines to find problems like tumors brain disorders and injuries mri gives a very detailed image helping doctors to see small changes in the tissues it is also safe because it does not use any harmful radiation we might have also heard about another method called ct scan it stands for computer tomography scan now let us see how it is different from mri see both mri and ct scans are used to see inside your body but they work differently and are used for different purposes mri uses magnets and radio waves providing very detailed image especially good for soft tissues like the brain muscles and joints it is safe for frequent use as it does not involve radiation but takes longer usually around 30 minutes to 1 hour mri is best for examining the brain spinal cord muscles and joints as said earlier on the other hand a ct scan uses x rays to take picture from different angle it is good for seeing bones chest and abdomen see the ct scan or faster usually taking only few minutes but they use radiation as they are not safe for repeated use ct scans or best for detecting bone fractures tumors and internal bleeding that's all about this article with this let's move on to our next topic for the discussion look at this editorial article it talks about the flaws in criminal justice system now suddenly it is in news because of a woman who filed a rape case was sentenced to imprisonment accusing that she has fabricated the rape case this case reinforces the damaging stereotype that the woman often make false claims about the sexual assault however a closer examination of the trial proceeding revealed numerous systematic flaws in the law enforcement and judicial processes these shortcoming include inadequate police investigation and overlooked social complexities highlighting urgent areas in need of reform within the criminal justice system this is the crux of this article given here in this backdrop let us revise some basics about new changes added to ipc crpc and evidence act etc know that ipc will be replaced by bharatiya nyaya sanhita bill 2023 the crpc of 1973 will be replaced by bharatiya nagrik suraksha sanhita 2023 whereas the indian evidence act of 1872 will be replaced by bharatiya saksha bill 2023 this will come into force from the july 1 of this year now let us see the key changes one by one first we shall see about the bharatiya nyaya sanhita that replaces ipc know that ipc gives a complete code intended to cover all aspects of criminal law so the new act retains most offenses from the ipc with certain crucial changes firstly it adds community service as a form of punishment the community service is a work in which a judge orders a defendant to perform as a form of punishment that benefits the community this can help in reforming the offenders and reducing the overprisoning and overcrowding in prisons then it repealed the offenses of sedition which was widely criticized as a colonial relic that curbed free speech and dissent instead 
there is a new offence for acts endangering the sovereignty, unity and the integrity of the nation. The bill also defines terrorism and offences such as separatism, armed rebellion against the government, challenging the sovereignty of the country, which were earlier mentioned under different provisions of the law. Then it prescribes capital punishment as a maximum sentence for mob lynching, which has been a menace in the recent years. It also proposes a 10 years imprisonment for a sexual intercourse with a woman on the false promise of marriage, which is a common form of deception and exploitation. Finally, the Act fixes a maximum limit of 180 days to file a charge sheet, which can speed up the trial process and prevent indefinite delays. Now, we shall see about Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sanhita 2023. In short, it is called BNSS 2. This seeks to replace the Criminal Procedure Code of 1973. See, the CRPC provides a binding procedure that must be followed during the administration of a criminal trial. Let us see the changes brought to it. Firstly, it promotes the use of technology for trials, appeals and recording, disposition, allowing a video conferencing for proceedings. It also makes video recording of the statements of the survivors of sexual violence compulsory, which can help in preserving the evidence and preventing coercion and manipulation. And also, the Act mandates that police must inform about the status of the complaint in 90 days, which can enhance accountability and transparency. Secondly, the Act requires that the police consult the victim before withdrawing a case punishable by 7 years or more which can ensure that justice is not compromised or denied. Most importantly, if a proclaimed offender has absconded to evade trial, there is no immediate prospect of arresting him. The trial can be conducted and the judgment pronounced in his absence. This can deter fugitives from escaping justice. Now, moving on to the Bharatiya Saksha Bill 2023, which is replacing Indian Evidence Act of 1872. See, the Indian Evidence Act provides rules and principles governing the evidence admissibility, the standard of proof and the weight to be given to the evidence submitted in the court. Know that the Bharatiya Saksha Bill retains most of the provisions of Indian Evidence Act, including those on the confession, relevance of the fact and the burden of proof. For example, the Indian Evidence Act provides for two kinds of evidence, that is, documentary and oral. Documentary evidence includes primary, that is, original documents and secondary, that proves the contents of the original. Whereas the Bharatiya Saksha Bill 2023 also retains the distinction but with a slight modification. Under the Indian Evidence Act, the electronic records are categorized as a secondary evidence. But in this bill, electronic records are classified as a primary evidence. It expands such records to include information stored in a semiconductor memory or any communication device such as smartphones, laptops. The bill also expands secondary evidence to include oral and written admission. The testimony of the person who has examined the document and is skilled in the examination of the documents. So that's all about this discussion. That's all for today's newspaper discussion. With this, let's move on to our next section that is prelims practice questions. Look at our first question. Consider the statements regarding elephants. African elephants are generally larger than the Asian elephants. Both male and female Asian elephants have tusk whereas African elephants, only some males have tusk. Female elephants play a crucial role in a herd which is typically matriarchal. Asian elephants have larger ears compared to the African elephants. How many of the statements given above are incorrect? Option A, only one. Option B, only two. Option C, three. Option D, none of the above. The correct answer is option B, only two. See, the statement two is incorrect because both male and female African elephants typically have tusk, whereas in Asian elephants, only some males have tusk. Statement 4 is also incorrect, because African elephants have larger ears compared to Asian elephants. Since this question asks for the incorrect answer, so the correct option is only 2, because statement 2 and statement 4 are only incorrect. Let's move on to our next question. Look at this question. Consider the following statements about MRI and CT scans. MRI uses strong magnets and radio waves to create detailed images of the body's internal organs and tissues. MRI scans are effective for imaging soft tissues like brain, muscles and joints. CT scans uses X-rays 
and are faster than MRI scans but involve radiation exposure. Both MRI and CT scans are equally safe for the frequent use due to their non-radiation nature. Which of the statements given above are correct? Option A only one, option B only two, option C only three and option D all the four. And the correct answer is option three and the correct answer is option C only three because the statement four is incorrect. As we have discussed only MRI is safe for frequent use due to its non-radiation nature whereas the CT scan involves radiation and it is not safe for repeated use. If you like this video please hit like, share and subscribe. Thank you.